live on Facebook as well and YouTube and of course our Zoom friends. Welcome everyone to part two of our three part series on Megillat Esther, the story of Esther and Mordechai and of course Haman. And we're going back over 2,000 years. We're between the first and second temple. Just a quick recap. And the Jewish people have found themselves scattered around the world, but mostly concentrated in Babylon and then into Persia. That's modern day Iran. And many of the Jewish people found themselves in Shushan. While this is happening, power had gone from Nebuchadnezzar, who destroyed the first temple in Jerusalem, and moved to someone called Belshazzar, and very quickly on to Ahasuerus. Ahasuerus had a second in command by the name of Haman. Haman comes from a nation called Amalek, and Amalek have been a thorn in the sides of the Jewish people for thousands of years, from the moment we left Egypt. Until that point in history, Amalek, that entire nation, just had a big problem for a number of reasons with the Jewish people. And we have Haman. Haman was given a promotion by Ahasuerus and given tremendous power and honor. And he was very wealthy because he gave him advice how to remove Vashti, his rebellious wife, from the palace. He actually killed her in a rather gruesome way. And everyone is honoring Haman except for one Jew, the chief rabbi of his day, and his name was Mordechai. And Mordechai refused point blank to give any honor to Haman. He wouldn't bow down to him. He wouldn't kneel to him. And this drove Haman absolutely crazy. So much so that he not only wanted to take revenge against Mordechai, but also take revenge against all the Jewish leaders and actually all the Jewish people throughout the 127 provinces that Megillah tells us, tells us Achat Veirosh ruled over. But we have a secret plan. And the plan started many years before when Esther was chosen to replace Vashti as the queen to Ahasuerus. However, Mordechai said, under no circumstances whatsoever must you tell Ahasuerus or anyone else your background, who you are, that you are Jewish, because that information needs to remain silent for your mission to be successful. And so be it. Esther agrees. She's now secreted in the palace, chosen from among thousands and thousands of women to be the queen of Ahasuerus. Of course, Mordechai and Esther both realize this happened for divine reasons and their mission is about to come into play. So everyone is in their positions. Mordechai had saved Ahasuerus' life from an assassination attempt. And he is outside the palace the entire time as a very important person is Shushan Habira. Shushan is the main city. Shushan Habira is the capital where only select individuals were allowed to be. Esther is secreted inside the palace, anonymous. Haman is given great power and wealth and he has made a poor, a lottery to kill the Jewish people which came out in the month of Adar on the 13th day, which is the last month of the Jewish calendar. And Ahasuerus is there, trying to keep his hand and control on power. And that's a quick recap of last class. Now, the holiday of Purim falls in the month of Adar. Adar is the last of the 12 Jewish months. We begin our months with Nisan, the month of Jewish people left Egypt, and that means the last month of the Jewish year is the month that precedes Nisan, which is Adar. The astrological symbol for the month of Adar is Pisces, fish, dug, or dagim actually. What is the symbol of Pisces? Fish. But not one fish, two fish. And not only two fish, two fish, if you remember seeing it, that are actually swimming in opposite directions. You have one fish going this way and then another fish going this way. What is the secret 
to the double opposing fish that represent the month of Adar, the month of the redemption, or the survival actually, of the Jewish people on Purim, and actually every Adar ever since, and even before. And the rabbis from the more mystical tradition tell us something amazing. They say that Adar is the month of Jewish reversal. When you think everything is going bad, when you're convinced that nothing is going to go right, and it looks like you're about to be swallowed up in the net and captured, just like the Jewish people were about to be wiped out by Haman and Achashverosh, the other fish goes the other way. That there's always Vinahafahu, things can turn around, and the survival of the Jewish people against all odds can happen in the blink of an eye. As we say in Hebrew, Yeshua Tashem Keheref Ayin. God's redemption comes in a moment. And so it looks like we're going to destruction, and suddenly, boom, we're going in the exact opposite direction. And this Purim story is the classic example of that. Because the Jewish people at this point were about to go down into destruction. And it's going to look like there is nothing that can save them. Achashverosh and Haman, two extremely powerful and wealthy people, collude to wipe out all the Jewish people. And yet, God's redemption comes in the blink of an eye. And remember that Adar was chosen. One of the reasons Adar was chosen by Haman is because he knew this was a bad month. Because on the 7th, of the Jewish month of Adar, Moshe Rabbeinu died. But what he wasn't knowledgeable about was that Moshe Rabbeinu was also born on the seventh day of Adar. So the fish goes this way, but there's also Mazal. There's also a redemption, salvation that can come in the opposite direction just as quick. And that's exactly what's about to happen. And so Haman, who is furious with Mordechai, and now makes it his desire to wipe out all the Jewish people, approaches Ahasuerus and has to persuade him, because Ahasuerus is still the leader of the non-free world. And he says, Ahasuerus, there is a nation, one nation, but they are Mufuad and Mufuzar. They are spread out. Mufuzar, spread out, Mufuad, separated. That means they are not going to give you any taxes, they're not going to help you in any way. There's no point having them. Give me the power and I'll even pay you 10,000 lumps of silver just to give me the privilege of killing these Jewish people. And Ahasuerus has no problems. They're spread out. We don't need them anyway. And Ahasuerus takes off his ring and gives it to Haman. Now, taking off your ring and giving it to someone else in those days, actually even to this day, we'll see in a moment, is a sign that you are giving power and equal prestige. It's one of the reasons that the groom gives a ring to the kala under the chuppah, that we are going to be consecrated and we're in this together. The ring was also a signet ring. What's a signet ring? It's a ring that they used to put wax onto decrees or envelopes and they would put their seal their seal from this ring that was your basically your signature that was giving authority to the other person so basically Ahasuerus signed off on Haman's evil terrible plan to kill all the Jewish people Haman very quickly gets to work and he sends out the decree to all the provinces that in the month of Adar, on the 13th day, every single Jewish person can be wiped out. And he even gave them a financial incentive. If you find any property that belongs to the Jew that, you're, that you kill, you get to keep it. And it's a legal decree signed with the ring of Haman that was given to him by Ahasuerus. You know, the rabbis tell us something amazing. The Gemara says, that the giving of this ring from Ahasuerus to the enemy of the Jewish people, Haman, did more to stir the Jewish people into shuva, in repentance, than every single word of every Jewish prophet throughout history. This was a very crude and quick awakening. And that's exactly what happened. And so Mordechai goes out and he starts to put on his sackcloth and ashes. Remember, there's a lot of references in Megillat Esther 
Two, clothing. Because remember, clothing covers the truth. And our job is to peel back the layers to see the true story underneath. That's one of the reasons we said that God's name is not mentioned in the book of Esther, the only book in all the scriptures where God's name is not mentioned, because we're expected to see, to go behind the curtain, to lift off the veil, go behind the curtain and see God's presence, divine consciousness that exists in this world. And so he goes out, Mordechai, and he puts on sackcloth and ashes in the public square, and he starts to scream, and he starts to cry, and shout. And eventually, Esther, who is secreted in the palace, hears about this and says to Mordechai via a messenger, who, by the way, according to our tradition, was Daniel the prophet, the great prophet who survived the lion's den, and says, who's referred to in the Megillah as Chatach, she says, tell Mordechai to put on some good clothing and come in to see me. And Mordechai replies to Esther and says, no way. I'm staying dressed as I am. I'm not coming in right now. My job is to alert the Jewish people and to cry out so they know this decree has been decreed against them. By the way, this decree came from Haman. We mentioned where Esther's name is mentioned in the Megillah. And we even mentioned last week where Mordechai's name is hinted at in the Torah, Esther's name in the Torah. Where is the name of Haman mentioned in the Torah? That is the question the Gemara asked. Now remember, Haman wasn't alive when the Torah, when the Bible was written. So it must be hinted at. And the rabbis tell us in a fascinating place. They tell us that in the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve ate from the tree, they turned around, they said, Hamina etz from this tree. Hamin, this species of tree, is Haman. Hey, Memnun. So Haman's name, is mentioned in the Bible at creation when Adam and Eve ate from the tree. Ha min ha ate from this tree. Why is Haman's name mentioned in reference to the tree, the forbidden tree, that was eaten at in the Garden of Eden? The rabbis tell us something fascinating and will give us a great insight into who Haman was and how Mordechai and Esther used that for his actual downfall. You see, Haman had everything. He had money. He had power. But there was one thing he was missing. Respect from one individual, and that was Mordechai. Adam and Eve, they could eat from any tree in the Garden of Eden. God allowed them to eat, but there was one tree they couldn't have. That one thing they couldn't have, that's what they wanted. They weren't satisfied with what they have. That was the problem with Haman. Haman was the greatest egotistical, narcissistic person ever. He had everything, all the money, all the power, but that one person ruined everything for him and he couldn't, he says himself in the Megillah to his wife and family and friends, I've got everything, but that Mordechai is ruining it all. Just like that one tree in the Garden of Eden, Hamina Etz, ruined it for Adam and Eve, so too they were now... This tree, as it were, appeared again. And Haman represents the evil inclination of the Garden of Eden, that I have everything, but one thing I can't have, I am not satisfied. So that's Haman. And now Esther says to Mordechai, we've got to get rid of this guy. I understand we have a problem. And Mordechai says, the time has come for you to go into Ahasuerus, tell him you're a Jew, and it's time to save the Jewish people. And Esther turns around and says, no, what? Are you crazy? You want me now to walk into Ahasuerus and tell him I'm a Jew? That's a suicide mission. Why? Because there was a law in the land that Ahasuerus himself concocted, and we'll see why in a moment, that if you wanted to see Ahasuerus, you needed 30 days permission. You needed to be have a warning and an invitation, and he could only see Ahasuerus after 30 days, even his own wife. I tried it with my wife, mm, didn't go well, heaven forbid. And so Esther says, I can't go in to see Ahasuerus because I haven't been invited, and he needed a 30 day grace period. Why would Ahasuerus make this really strange law that you need a 30 day gap in order to come in and see him in his inner chamber, even his own family? 
And the answer is because Achishverosh, if you remember, is a paranoid dictator. There was already an assassination attempt. So he created a iron circle, a ring around himself and his palace, so that no one could just walk in where they want to, because then he's open to death. Like every dictator is very, very scared of their enemies, but they're also scared of their close friends who are very close to them. And so he was so paranoid, he made a law that no one could see him within 30 days. That was the way he had to protect himself. So Esther says, Mordechai, I have been invited. If I walk in, I'm going to get killed. On the off chance, there's a possibility that he puts out his golden scepter. And if he does that, I get to touch it. And that means I get to live. But the chances of that are very, very remote. I can't do it. And then Mordechai, in what I consider to be the most profound part of the Megillah, turns around to Esther and says, I'm going to give you three reasons why you must go in and risk your life now to save the Jewish people. What are those three reasons? Number one, he says, don't think because you're all safe and rich and famous in the palace of Achishverosh that you're going to survive this Jewish massacre. And think about it, my friends. How many Jewish people have denied their Judaism and thought, oh, I'll be a French citizen. I'll be a Russian citizen. I'll be a German citizen. And everything's going to be okay. They'll overlook the fact that I'm Jewish. It doesn't work that way. Eventually, they find out you're a Jew and you're going to get it as well. So that was argument number one that Mordechai uses on Esther to get her to agree to this. Number two, he says, if you don't do it, someone else is going to. We have a promise, a guarantee to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob that the Jewish people are always going to be there until the Messiah comes. They're not going to go away. And therefore, God is going to find some other mechanism and probably some other person to save the Jewish people. And this means you're going to miss out. And your family's name, he said, is going to be forgotten. Because instead of Megillat Esther, or be Megillat Shoshana, Barbara, Emily, whatever. And finally, he says, don't think that you receive this position as queen for any other reason than to save the Jewish people. You've been given this money and this power to save the Jewish people, says Mordechai to Esther. This is your moment. Your entire life has come down to one moment. It's a terrifying thought that our entire lives, all the experiences and all the challenges, all the successes come down to one decision that we get to make once in our lives. We better be prepared for that moment, say the rabbis. Esther accepted that plan and she goes in. But before she does, she turns around to Mordechai and says, listen, I can't do this alone. I need the entire Jewish people unified. Because Haman, if you remember, described us as Mufuzar and Mufura, separated, disunited. They're not going to win. And Esther says, we've got to show him that we're wrong. Kenos, said Yudim, gather the Jewish people together. Tell them we need unity and have them fast for three days. No food and no drink. And I will as well. And they fasted. Think of how you feel after a one day fast Yom Kippur. The power and the desperation of the Jewish people at this time was to fast and to pray to God for three days straight. And they all did. Actually, they even missed the Pesach Seder that year. The Pesach Seder was cancelled and everyone fasted during the Pesach Seder. There was no Matzah, Maror, Korn Pesach, all gone. They had to fast and pray for the survival. And people got upset and said, you're going to get rid of all the beautiful mitzvot of Pesach. And she's like, what's the point of Pesach if we're not alive? We won't be able to celebrate it next year. And they all listened. So Esther now, and actually the power shifted from Mordechai, who was making the decisions up to that point, to Esther. And she says, Mordechai, get it together. We've got to do this. And after three days, the end of her fast came. And she went in to see Achashverosh. And as she walked in, we're told that she went in in her royal attire. And the Gemara says that God's presence rested upon her. And Achashverosh saw her. Immediately his heart melted and he handed out his scepter 
his golden scepter. Esther touched it, which was a sign that she was okay. And he says, what's your she'ela? What's your bakasha? What's your request? How can I help? And she says, I have a personal request, but I also have a request for my people. But I can't tell you now. I need you and Haman to come to a feast that I'm preparing tomorrow. And I'm going to tell you everything. And Ahasuerus was very excited because he was getting a guarantee that he was finally going to find out Esther's background. Now, what was Esther's plan? Why didn't she just tell him right then, I'm Jewish, there's this crazy maniac, Haman, and he's going to wipe me out and my entire people. Why does she invite him to a feast? And at that feast of Haman and Achishperosh, she's actually going to invite them to a second feast the very next day. What precisely was Esther's plan and Mordechai's plan? And if you read the Megillah, it's very difficult to actually see what they were getting at. And the reason it's not explained and written explicitly in the Megillah what their plan was, because as you mentioned last week, at the end of the story, Ahasuerus doesn't die. He's still in power and he's still married to Esther. So everything in reference to Ahasuerus in the Megillah looks very neutral. We're not told that he killed his wife Vashti, right? Because actually he loved her. It could have upset him and would have made him look terrible. So there's many things that Ahasuerus does, which we know from oral tradition, from the Gemara and the Midrash and many stories, that are not put in the Megillah because it really would have made Ahasuerus look bad after the story would have finished and he would have been presented and got to read the Megillah Esther himself because Mordechai and Esther wrote the Megillah. So he does not look bad during this story. He's cleansed. He's let off the hook. But Haman is not. And that's why even when Haman asks Ahasuerus to kill the Jewish people, it doesn't say that they are the Jewish people. Now that's important because the plan, listen very carefully, that Mordechai and Esther devise to save the Jewish people is extremely dangerous, very, very suicidal for both Esther, Mordechai and all the Jewish people and had to be done in a very specific way. You see, had she just walked in and said, I'm Jewish, kill Haman, he could have turned around and said, why should I? You know what? I prefer Haman to you. You're just another wife. I killed Vashti. I can kill you too. So they had to use a certain strategy, which is hinted at. And the strategy is that Esther invites Haman to the party the next day in order to do two things. Number one, make Haman feel really good and confident because the bigger you are, the further you fall. But on the other side, it's got to make Ahasuerus suspicious that Haman and Esther were in a collusion and maybe even a romantic relationship to overtake Ahasuerus. So they were actually playing in to the paranoia that Ahasuerus always had towards being toppled and removed from power by his closest people, which in this case is Haman. That, my friends, was the secret plan of Mordechai and Esther, which if you think about it, is totally insane. What a crazy plan. Because basically Esther's gonna walk into this party and say, me and Haman, we're colluding together. And you should be very careful of Haman because that's what he's trying to do. And I'm involved in it with him. That's exactly. And what would Ahasuerus do? Kill Haman, kill Esther, kill her cousin Mordechai, and then, okay, let the Jewish people die as well. So they had to act really carefully just to make sure the right power balance was happening between Ahasuerus, Haman, Mordechai, and Esther. And they did it perfectly, of course, with God's help. So now the first party happens. 
And Haman is elated because there he is drinking and eating. And he not only has power and money, he's now best friends with Achashverosh and as far as he's concerned, with Esther as well. So his guard starts to drop and Achashverosh is niggled. He can't exactly put his finger on it, but something is off over here. And at night time, he goes to sleep, but he keeps having a dream that something is off and he wakes up and he calls his people together and says, read for me the book of Chronicles. Maybe this dream is coming to me because I owe someone a favor or I was nasty to someone. Why is my sleep keep being disturbed? And they read out immediately that actually Ahasuerus does owe a favor to someone called Mordechai who saved his life when there was an assassination attempt, if you remember, by two guys, Big Dan and Teresh, and he never paid Mordechai back. At that moment, he hears someone in the garden. Who's that? Haman. Haman comes in the middle of the night. Why is Haman coming in the middle of the night? To tell Ahasuerus and ask him to allow him to kill Mordechai and all the Jewish people. But Ahasuerus is like, wait a minute, I'm already suspicious of this Haman character. He's getting too pally-pally with my wife Esther. And now he comes in the middle of the night. Why do people walk into your house in the middle of the night? To hurt you. That's not why he was coming. But in Ahasuerus' paranoia, that's what he thought. And Haman walks in. And Ahasuerus says, you know what, I need to honor someone. Haman thinks he's speaking about him because remember, Haman is a great narcissist. If anyone needs favors, it must be me. If anyone's great and needs to be honored, it must be me. Ahasuerus was testing him. Testing to see whether he really thought he was the one being honored when actually he wanted to honor Mordechai. And Haman says, oh, you want to honor someone that you love? You know what? Dress him up in beautiful royal clothing and have him walked through the city so everyone can hail him and give him great honor for what he's doing. And Ahasuerus says, you do exactly that to Mordechai. So now he starts to bring Haman down and lift Haman. Now the power balance starts to readjust itself and Ahasuerus is trying to make sure that Haman wasn't getting too big for his boots and holding him down. And he realized that Haman had aspirations for royal power, even his job, when he said, dress up this person in royal attire. So Mordechai is now led through the town by Haman in his royal clothing, a great disgrace to him and his power. He goes home, tells his wife what happened. His wife says, oh my goodness, this is not looking good. Forget about your plans. Cancel killing Mordechai on this big 50 I'm a hundred foot gallows. Forget that. Forget the Jewish people. You're never going to win. Let it be. As soon as she says that, he's invited to the second feast. And so he walks in to the second feast. And there is Esther. And there is Ahasuerus. And Haman didn't get a moment's respite from this whole episode Everything I just told you happened in one day. There was years and years and years of inaction and suddenly, bam, it all happens quickly. We go from the Jewish people about to be completely wiped out to, to the Jewish people now on the precipice of absolute and complete redemption. Because when God's redemption comes, it comes in the blink of an eye. So now Haman is sitting there with Ahasuerus and with Esther. And Ahasuerus is mad in love with Esther. And he says, Esther, whatever your question is, I'll give it to you. Even half of my kingdom, he says, even Chatzimalchad, you can take it. He was offering her a vast amount of power and land. By the way, the rabbis say he was only offering half. The other half was Israel, which he wasn't willing to relinquish at all at this point. And Esther finally has given Ahasuerus enough fear that Haman was a threat, lifted Haman enough, high enough, that he felt secure in his power, and the time had come for her to reveal her origins. And she says, I have a she'ela, which means I have a personal request, and I have a bakasha, I have a request for my people, because I am 
a Jew. And this Haman, who you have given power and money and ability to wipe out my people and me as well. This is the Rasha. And the hint behind the story, which you don't see in the Megillah, is that this has been his plan all along to marry me and take your kingship. Achashverosh is furious. He jumps up and he goes out for a walk in his garden. The rabbis tell us that there were some people there who were uprooting trees in the Gina, in the garden of Achashverosh. And he said, what are you doing over here? And he said, oh, Haman told us to do this. So Achashverosh, by the way, according to our tradition, these were angels who were planted there at this time to give Achashverosh the impression that Haman really was even preparing for his big takeover of Achashverosh's palace power and wife Esther. Achashverosh is now furious. Haman cannot believe it. He had no idea that Esther was Jewish, a prophetess, and planning to bring his demise. He stands up, terrified. He approaches Esther and he trips and falls down on the bed that she was lying on because that's where the feast was taking place. As that happens, Achashverosh walks in and sees Haman lying at the feet of Esther. What does he immediately think? Not only do you try to take my power, you're even trying to violate and take my wife. Are you trying to kill her? Are you trying to hurt her? That's it. You're dead. And he makes a decree there and then that Haman is dead. And if you look at the Megillah, it tells us that immediately they covered over the face of Haman with a cloth because even the sight of Haman in Achashverosh's eyes made him crazy. And so Esther removed, Achashverosh removes the ring from Haman's finger and his power has been taken away. And as we know, Haman and all of his sons end up being hanged all in one day. That should be the end of the story. Haman's dead. Esther is alive. But we still have one more very important class because we've only reached a three quarters of the way through the Megillah because something is still there. And that something, my friends, is the decree. The decree to wipe out the Jewish people is still there. As far as everyone is aware, the Jewish people can be killed in about a year's time, a little less than a year. They were in Nisan and Adar is less than a year away, is going to wipe out all the Jewish people and take all their property. So Mordechai and Esther are left with an even bigger dilemma. How exactly are we going to reverse the decree that Haman made to kill all the Jewish people? I mean, it looks like it's impossible. How can we do that? If we just turn around and be like, okay, ignore it, then Achashverosh is going to look like a complete idiot. Right? He sends out decrees and they're ignored. What's they going to do? Any future decree is also going to be ignored. So they're going to have to use a lot of political persuasion and very carefully find a mechanism to get that decree to be turned around and they're going to have to act quickly. Because although the decree is not going to come into effect for another year, my friends, the danger was still there. We learn a story from this that when the opportunity to help other people especially people who are in danger for their lives, especially your own people. If the opportunity comes, don't be like, eh, I tried a couple of months. Get on it right now because the job could take much longer than you realize. It was also the month of Nisan, which is the first Jewish month, which is a good month for the Jewish people because that was the month we went free from Egypt about a thousand years before that point, And therefore they realized they needed to act quick and quickly they did act. And so next week, we're going to see 
the strategy that Mordechai and Esther used was actually a brilliant strategy because they used a cunning plan to kill Haman. They're going to use something even more cunning to figure out how to reverse and remove the decree that Haman's decree that still stood with Ahasuerus' permission to wipe out all the Jewish people. And we'll also see how all the mitzvot that we do on Purim have the power to bring a similar redemption to the Jewish people, no matter where we are and whenever we are. And so Thursday night, my friends, this Thursday night begins the month of Adar. And as we said, Adar has inside it the seeds for tremendous political, spiritual, and yes, even financial success for us. And therefore, do celebrate Rosh Chodesh, which is Friday and Shabbat this year, because the month of reversals is here. And although we've been suffering for the past year, and it started around Purim time, if you remember, with this coronavirus, we learned from the Purim story many things, but one of them is, even the worst times, just like the two fish, Pisces, which is the astrological symbol for Adar, go both ways. We can be going this way and it can all turn around in the blink of an eye when God wants it to. We'll finish over there. We'll pick this up next week for our third and final class on Megillat Esther. And we're going to see how Mordechai and Esther finally save the Jewish people. Have an amazing, successful, and great month, and a great new month of Adar. Thank you.